court life in the kingdom of Mali. The Empire of Mali was founded by Sanjata Keita in the African era 1240 AD in 5476 after the conquest of the declining Empire of Wagadu or ancient Ghana. Mali is conquered in 5712 by the Sani Albier who founded the Songa Empire. The famous Arab traveler Ibn Battuta described life at the Malian courts in 5587 during the rule of the Mansa Suleiman. Mansa Kankumasa, legendary emperor of Mali and richest man of all time. Illustration by Kefra Burns on the days of the trial. The emperor sat in an alcove and communicated with the palace through a duel. He has three wooden windows covered with layers of silver and three more windows underneath that are covered with gold and vermilion stripes, we can conclude that the palace had at least one floor. These windows are covered with curtains. A handkerchief with Egyptian images tied on a silk cord was pushed through the fence that protected them on the listening days. The people were greeted by the sound of horns and drums called. Three hundred soldiers armed with bows and spears are lined up in two pillars on each side of the window in which the emperor is to sit. Those who hold spears form the outer ranks and stand. Those who have bows sit in front. The four pillars face each other. Two saddled and restrained horses and two rams are brought. The practice reminds us of Ghana. Almost 300 test subjects are running in a hurry for Kanja Musa. The Fararis, the Sheikhs, the preacher Chatib and the Balif have arrived and are sitting in front of the soldiers on the left and right in the room that separates the pillars. Duga, the herald, stands at the door, clad in Zedkanan clothes. He wears a fringe turban that is modeled on the style of the country. He is the only one who has the privilege of wearing boots that day. He has a sword with a golden scabbard on his side. He holds spurs, two gold and silver spears with an iron point. The soldiers and officials, the sides, the Mosafites and others stay outside in a wide street with planted trees. When the emperor arrives behind the window, Duga acts as an intermediary, conveying the orders, receiving compliance, passing them on to sovereign who makes a decision. It happens that the hearing takes place in a palace. A seat covered with silk is therefore set up and raised on three terraces. This throne is called Ben B. A cushion is placed there and the whole thing is covered with a silky dome-shaped parasol with a golden bird the size of a sparrow hawk on its stalk. The Mansa Emperor leaves the palace with a bow in hand and a quiver on her back. He wears a golden fabric turban tied with golden ribbons, the metal tips on which are longer than the palm of a hand, like daggers. He wears a red coat made of European fabric, the mountain fez. The singers go before him holding gold and silver combs. They move slowly forward, followed by nearly 300 armed soldiers, and stop from time to time. Before he sets down on his seat, he looks around slowly, then horns, trumpets and drums sound as soon as he sits down. Again the two horses and the ram which protects against misfortune are brought. Duga is in his usual place, near the Mansa. The rest of the people are outside. The Ferraris are called. Then the meeting begins under the usual circumstances and as in Ghana. The Swahili Civilization Manda, Kilwa, Songo, Mnara, Mombasa, Pate, Malindi, etc. So many names, so many cities, with an absolute prestigious history. The remains of which still bear witness to the brilliance of the past few years. 1,100 years ago, the Bantu peoples on the coasts and islands of Kenya and Tanzania laid the foundation for the Swahilian civilization that would illuminate East Africa for centuries. The famous Arab traveler Ibn Battuta said that Kilwa at that time was one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Reminds of Kilwa, Tanzania Origins The starting point of the East African coastal civilizations is a trading town called Rapta, which would be located off Tanzania. Its existence is mentioned in a 2,000-year-old Greek document. In 2016, researcher diver Alan Sutton discovered the ruins of a large, partially entwined city off the coast of Tanzania, which will likely be Rapta. The huge blocks of coral carved and put together by the ancient Africans to build buildings on the discovered site would predict the building methods of the Swahili civilization. 
In addition, the presence of Roman currency coins in Kenya attests to the very early existence of international trade. In the continuity of these legacies, the prestigious cities of the coast will arise in the 10th century. This shows that contrary to what is thought to be, East African civilizations were essentially black and African. So the researcher Matthew says that all the cities on the East Coast were essentially African. It is becoming increasingly clear that they cannot be considered as Arab or Persian colonies. According to the descriptions of the geographers of the in the Middle Ages, these inhabitants were undoubtedly black and even a Negro type than that of a today's population. Image of the site discovered by Alan Sutton, possibly Raptor. The appearance of the Sohelian language and culture. In Kenya, an intensive interaction began between the Pakomo people and nine tribes of the Nijikenda, Duruma, Kambe, Jibana, Jiriyama, Dogi, Shonei, Kaume, Ruba, and Ribe. From there, common culture and language was born and expanded to Tanzania and the Comoros. When they got to the area, the Arabs called the place Sahil, meaning coast. Swahili comes from Sahil. The local language, a Bantu language, was a mixture of Pokomo and Mijikenda and was called Ki Swahili. That is the language of the coast. Ki is a Bantu prefix that denotes the language as in Kikongo, Kimbundu, or Kirundi. Many Arabic and Persian words have been added to the Ki Swahili. Although this structure remains African to this day, and its vocabulary is mainly African. This is the kind of dynamic with which the Bantu people brought forth the Swahili culture and civilization, later enriched by the contributions of the Arabs and Persians, Iranians, who had come to set up trading posts and who sometimes raided the residents to get them enslaved. This explains why this civilization is called Bantu Islamic. Mijik and the man from Kenya. These people are in part of the origin of the Swahili civilization. The organization of the Swahili state cities. The Swahili cities have never been under the central authority of a supreme power. These were state cities under the sovereignty of a local power. The cities, although they are aware of their cultural community, completed for control of successful international trade. The king bears the title Mfalme, which is linguistically African. He comes from the royal family and takes the throne by marrying one of the royal wives. These women have the legitimacy of power in accordance with the African matriarchal tradition. The royal caste was divided into Ndugu, that is generation. The king who comes from a generation does not rule for life. He rules until the next generation prince, chosen from among the suitors, marries a woman of royal blood. The crown prince was crowned on his wedding day. To the best of our knowledge, this extremely interesting generation system was unique in Africa. Reminds of Songo Mnara, Tanzania. The matriarchal transfer of power continued with the arrival of Islam. It must be said that it was an Islam that was heavily influenced by vitalistic, animistic rites. Coastal residents say that these Muslim dynasties were founded by Arabs, but the Arab world is incompatible with matriarchy. It was probably Islamized Africans who invented their origins from the Eastern world through alienation like the Fulani or Hausa. As for defense, a king had thousands of cavalrymen with 300,000 oxen to ride. The Swahili economy. The southern Swedish coastal cities earned most of their wealth from continental trade with the rest of Africa and international trade with the East, East Asia and even the blacks of Australia, as we know now today. The abundant wealth from South African mines, gold tin, was partly exported from the Swahili coast. The testimony says that a king killed 700 elephants each year to get ivory, some of which was also exported. Animal hides, iron tools and agricultural products were also sold through the ports. Cabotage and deep sea fishing were carried out. Leopard and jackal hunts have been conducted, and hypnotic techniques have been reported to render cats harmless. Although the ceramics were made locally, earthenware was imported from Iran and China and valuable Asian fabrics were also valued. Originally, like everywhere in Africa, the currency was made from shellfish. From the 13th century, the kings, especially in Kilwa, began to issue their currency in bronze and silver. The wealth in gold was so great that it was considered less valuable than the other two. All of these intense activities resulted in considerable wealth and a class of wealthy traders who influenced royal power 
each of them inventing Arab origins for themselves in order to maintain or gain influence. Kilwa coins discovered by Ian McIntosh team in Australia in 2013. The Swahili navigation. The coastal residents of Bantu had boats of various sizes and functions. From the Mtumbi, a canoe carved into a tree trunk with an axe to the Mtepe, a large ship that sailed in the Indian Ocean. The Portuguese who came to the region in the 16th century described the ports as crowded with sometimes huge ships. The residents traveled to China, a country with which they had diplomatic relations. In China, for example, there is an illustration of a Mtepe transporting an elephant to be offered to the Chinese. But it must be said that most of the seafaring on the Indian Ocean was done by Arabs, then by 15th century Chinese. Malindi, Kenya, Kilwa, Manda, Kenya, Kilwa, Kilwa, it's absolutely wonderful, Kilwa, Kilwa, Godfather Tanzania, Kilwa, the fall of the Swahili civilization. The Swahili civilization was destroyed by the attacks of the Portuguese during the European slave trade in the 16th century. As explained here, the region was subsequently hidden from the Arab slave trade. Mansa Kanku Musa, the richest man ever. Kanku Musa Keita, Mansa, Emperor of Mali. Illustration by Barbara Higgins Bond. When the very rich and powerful Mali Empire wanted to cross the maritime borders in the 56th century of the African era, it provided 200 ships with provisions to cross the Atlantic. The operation ended in failure as only one captain returned. The Mansa Emperor Abu Bakar Keita II decided to undertake another expedition. He equipped 2,000 ships and took the head of the fleet. It is not known whether Abu Bakr reached America, but Christopher Columbus himself testifies with material evidence of the important trade relationship between Africa and America during his lifetime. Kanku Musa then became Mansa in 5548 AD, 1312 AD, replacing his older brother Abu Bakr II who went to America. Kanku Musa is best known for his incredible fortune and important reforms within the empire. According to a study by wealth specialist Celebrity Net Worth, backed by almost every reputable magazine in the world, Kanka Musa is the richest man in the world has ever had, with a fortune of 400 trillion six times the current Bill Gates. Wealth and five times at a colorless, slim Mexican, the richest man on the planet. The Empire of Mali Founded by Sunjata Keita was certainly the richest country in the world at the time and well reflects the economic situation of all of Africa on the eve of the European slave trade and the acceleration of the Arab slave trade. Kanku Musa, illustration by Angus McBride. Mansa Kanku Musa made a pilgrimage to Mecca with 100 camels, each camel loaded with 300 pounds of gold. 500 servants with 4 pounds of gold each, thousands of his subjects and his great royal spouse with their 500 servants. He offered so much gold on the way to Cairo and then in Mecca that he lowered the exchange rate of his metal in the markets and ruined the Egyptian economy for 10 years. He ran out of money because of his expensive lifestyle had to borrow something to travel home. Eastern fantasy long retained the memory of the splendid visit of the Negro king. The popular legend about the extreme wealth of the African was thus reinforced. The construction of the mosque at Gao and Timbuktu was wrongly attributed to an Arab architect whom Kanku Musa would have brought back from his trip. But as Sheikh Anto Diop shows, it is an abusive interpretation of the documents. In addition, Malian architecture shows characteristic features of the black continent with its pyramidal style inherited from Egypt and Nubia, which does not obey Arab architectural norms. The Kamets blacks are then the origin of Mali's architecture which was built with their own intrinsic tools. The Mansa developed education and trade, Jena, Timbuktu and Gao became centers of trade and culture. An intellectual production, especially literary, supplanted intellectual production in North Africa. Kanku Musa Illustration by Kefra Burns Kanku Musa expanded the empire and brought it to its height to the territorial plan which brought stability and prosperity. He died in 5573, leaving the image of an empire known worldwide for its wealth. P.S. The renowned American magazine Time confirms that Mansa Kanku Musa was the richest man of all time. 
but they cannot estimate its net worth. Emphasizing that the second on the list, the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar was worth 4,600 billion. PS2. We know today, thanks to the works of the Afro-Guyan historian Ivan Van Satima in his book They Came Before Columbus, that the Malian people under the leadership of Abubakari II reached America before Columbus. You can read our article on this subject here. The African Roots of the Ancient American Civilizations the Sudanese on their way to America. Tahaka, the legendary Sudanese pharaoh of Egypt. Illustration according to National Geographic. In 1090 BC, the white invaders captured and enslaved in the temples were set free. They fired the autochthonous black authorities in northern Egypt and the legitimate custodians of the institutions they were retreating to the south. For 300 years, Tamari, Egypt, remained in the hands of kinglets from the north. Tamari therefore called on the kings on the lands of her ancestors, the Sudanese King Pianki, who together with his successors Shabaka, Shabataka and Tahaka, began and strengthened the conquest of Egypt by legitimate African power. After the Sudanese emperors liberated and controlled Tamari, the country faced its powerful Assyrian neighbor who tried to deny its hegemony in Western Asia. The Nubian Sudanese, who then controlled the entire northern eastern part of Africa, that is, almost a quarter of the continent, brought to light the magnificent Egyptian civilization that they spawned. A cold war broke out between Kama, Africa and Assyria. The Red Sea routes were closed and Africa needed metals to complete its weapons. The Africans then decided to take it where it was, not only in Great Britain as usual, but also in very large countries that no one remembers today. The sea route to America, where Ramesu Marimana fetched his tobacco around, 1,300 took part in the war. Nubian warriors took on board, crossed the Mediterranean, took in the ocean currents on the Atlantic and reached Mexico. There they met the Indians, who were later called Olmecs. The time was 700 BC. Then we will talk about this man, or rather their effects. Indian civilization would then start shining brilliantly after meeting the Sudanese who brought their own civilization with them. These are baby faces. The sculptors actually tried to depict the features of the jaguar. The tools used were not sharp enough to show mongoloid, Indian or white features. But also best of all, the chiseled faces were fine. They flattened themselves when they fell from the mountain. The images shown below are mostly those of the African-American historian Renoko Rashidi. Salapa Museum, Mexico The African scholar Ivan Van Satima had to publish his book They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in North America. In order to stop all these absurdities and for the Western world to recognize the parts of Africa at the beginning of the pre-Columbian civilization. Aside from the several Negroid sculptures found across South America, the most amazing was Ivan Van Satima's demonstration on the connections between the Egyptian Nubian civilization and the Indian civilizations before Columbus' arrival in America. The Egyptian Nubian presence in pre columbian America, the Indians suddenly began building pyramids 2,700 years ago, the largest of which, located in Teotihuacan, has the same foundation as the Great Pyramid of Giza. They built Great Pyramids, which at that time could only be found in Nubia. The Indians suddenly managed to erect these extremely complex religious buildings that Westerners today, despite their technology, could no longer reproduce. The ancient Egyptians who used to carve stones of completely different shapes and sizes to build walls and who fitted together according to a very precise order, transmitted this really complex technology to the Indians through the Nubians. An African Pyramid and an American Pyramid the Indians then apparently spread this technology to Easter Island. The Native American calendar consists of 12 months of 30 days to which 5 epigonominal days are added, which are holidays like in ancient Egypt. Suddenly the Indians would encourage incest between brothers and sisters of the royal families in order to preserve the purity of the blood due to the African matriarchal tradition which is also effective in the Indian tradition. One finds royal incest between brothers and sisters only in the ancient Egyptian and Nubian worlds, and more recently the same practice could be found in the African empires of Wene Motapa, Mono Motapa, and Congo, as well as in Hawaii by a probable diffusion from America. Mummification spread on the south side from Mexico to Peru and in the north to the USA. 
The Indians even mummified dogs like in ancient Egypt. They mummified their dead in the same way as in ancient Egypt. The fact of taking the internal organs through the anus and placing these organs in four different earthenware vases have very precise colors in the direction of the four cardinal points. They place the dead in a sarcophagus with a flat base, arms crossed on their chest and fingers spread, a golden death mask like the blacks of the Nile Valley used to do. The Indians stretched the members of the heads of the nobility like the daughters of Pharaoh Akhenaten or, like until a decade ago, the Magbetu from the Congo. The purple color served the same ceremonial purposes in both Africa and America. This is how the Sudanese, bearers of Egyptian civilization, introduced the Indian Olmecs of Mexico to African culture and technology. This Olmec civilization was the first monumental civilization in America, the mother of the famous Inca and Mayan civilization. The Sudanese presence in America particularly enlightens us about the black Mayan race we saw above. Hence, the Maya were obviously of Egyptian Sudanese descent. The Mayans left had the same elongated heads as in Africa. All right above, daughter of Pharaoh Akhenaten Akhenaten. Bottom right, Mangabetu child, Democratic Republic of the Congo. As for the Aztec civilization, it benefited from the contribution of the Madinka to the genius of the Indians 700 years ago. In summary, it can be said that here the similarities between America and ancient Africa which leave no room for chance and undoubtedly confirm the African presence in ancient America. This is a summary of Ivan Van Septima's detailed 35-page demonstration on the civilizing rule of blacks in America. Far from carrying out an extermination operation like the Europeans later, Kamita accompanied the Indians in the most important phases of the flowering of their genius. It is clear that reading the book would provide more confidence about the subject. To illustrate our words, let's add the first part of this documentary below, which rigorously shows the similarities between ancient Egypt, ancient American civilizations, and of Easter Island. In particular, the complexity of the architecture is examined.